Thanks to Hover for sponsoring this video and supporting my channel. Hey there, my name is Thomas Frank, and for the past about eight years, I have made my full-time living on the internet. That's been done primarily through my blog, College Info Geek, a podcast that I run, and this YouTube channel, with income sources ranging from speaking engagements to YouTube ads to sponsorships, affiliate marketing, sales of my own book, and a secret OnlyFans account. One of those is a lie. <laughs> Can we leave that in the video? <laughs> So as somebody who makes their living primarily from creating things for the internet, I naturally get a lot of questions from people who want to do the exact same thing. And I remember being one of the people asking those questions. Back when I started my blog about 10 years ago, I was primarily doing it just to boost my resume and to have fun, but I quickly started reading blogs written by people who were making their full-time incomes, sometimes over six figures, just running their blogs. At first, I thought this lifestyle would be impossible for me to achieve. The freedom seemed alluring, but I felt that that was for other people who got lucky and I would just have to work a job and just blog on the side. But I was curious, so I started learning and started devouring as much as I could possibly get my hands on, from the tiniest details on website speed to the marketing psychology behind the colors of buttons on landing pages. And about two and a half years after I first started my blog, I hit full-time income for the first time. About three years ago, I hit six figures in income for the first time, and last year we did over half a million dollars in gross revenue. I'm throwing these numbers out here not to brag, but to provide a little bit of context on A, what's possible, B, what's happened in my experience, and to hopefully give myself a little bit of credibility for making a video like this. So today, what I wanna do is kind of explain some of the ways that you can use to make money on the internet if that's something that you wanna do. So first, we're gonna cover some pretty important groundwork here and then I'm gonna be covering five different ways that you can use to make money on the internet and for each of these methods I'm gonna give you some tips for both getting started in it and being more successful with it to lay down that groundwork I talked about the main idea I want to communicate here is this making money on the internet is just like making money out in the physical world in at least one key dimension which is that you have to have some way of providing scarce value so what do I mean by that? Well, value is obvious. If you remember your economics class, you probably remember that money is number one, a store of value, number two, a medium of exchange, and number three, a unit of account. So essentially money is a way of giving a numeric value to, well, value. I value not mowing my lawn, so I pay a lawn mowing company to do it instead. Of course, there are different levels of value as well. Something that I value more than that is having a person to edit my videos, which is also something that takes more skill. So as a result, I pay my editor Tony quite a bit more than I pay the lawn mowing company. By scarce, I mean not abundant. The more choice that a customer has when it comes to a given service, the more you as the service provider are gonna have to start competing on price. And the more you have to compete on price, the more you have to start eating into your margins, which is the difference between your income and what you had to spend to make that income on things like uh, buying inventory, running ads, paying for web hosting, whatever it might be. A great example here is drop shipping. And I will not be surprised if you get an ad for a drop shipping course on this video if you're watching it on YouTube. But essentially, dropshipping is a business model where you identify a product, set up an online store for it, and then when a customer orders that product, you actually send that order to a supplier who sends it to the customer. You don't keep anything on hand. This is a very attractive business model because number one, you don't have to spend any money up front on inventory, which is usually risky and requires warehouse space. And number two, you don't even have to deal with the hassle of shipping orders to customers. Instead, as the ads for so many dropshipping courses will tell you, all you gotta do is find a cool product, build an online site where people can order that product, and then just drive traffic to the website using slick Instagram ads or search engine optimization whatever. And you can do all of that while sipping a margarita from a beach in Bali, as long as it has Wi-Fi. But you're gonna be doing it alongside about a billion other dude bros trying to do the exact same thing. So remember this, Easy, low cost of entry equals huge competition equals razor thin or sometimes non-existent margins, which can put you in the hole. A better option is finding a way to increase the value of what you're offering or make it more unique somehow. For example, while most editors can provide basic cuts, Tony can do color grading, he can do intricate sound design, and he knows how to use B-roll to make the video that you're watching a little bit more pleasing to the eye. But of course, those skills take time and practice to 
develop. And in some cases, there may even be some form of monetary investment, like, I don't know, buying a $2,000 sound effects library. So keep this in mind. Before you can make significant money on the internet, you have to find a way of providing scarce value. Anybody who is telling you anything different is almost certainly trying to sell you something, and it's probably a course that helps them make money not doing the thing that they're teaching you how to do. You have to provide value. Luckily, there is more than one way to do that. So freelancing is probably the best place to start here because it is, in my opinion, one of the easiest ways to start making a decent amount of money on the internet fairly quickly, especially if you have a skill to start with. It's also the place where I started. Back in high school, I started a freelance web design business and I put up a website trying to get clients and I actually landed a few that helped pay my bills throughout college. Now I will admit that a lot of the clients I got didn't actually come from the internet. Some of them came from word of mouth referrals in my local area and for other ones, I was actually making cold sales calls trying to get clients. But eventually I did get two clients who found me through Google searches and they hired me for ongoing web work that actually, again, paid some of the bills that I had during college and provided some decent money. If you wanna talk about numbers, I think the first website I ever built, I charged about 350 bucks for, and the last one I built before I moved into blogging, I charged around $2,000. So you can make some pretty good money doing web development. Whatever you wanna do, if you wanna get into freelancing, you first have to learn a skill that is in demand and that ideally you can do over the internet. So I'm talking about things like web development, video editing, podcast editing is a big one, professional writing, and sometimes even bookkeeping. Another option is actually doing in-person services, but marketing them over the internet using geo-targeted ads or by just targeting people in your area in other ways. So this could be things like photography and videography, maybe being a wedding photographer, doing interior decorating, or, and I'm surprised this is a thing, but I researched it and it is, you could become a decluttering and minimalism consultant. Did you say minimalism? In fact, you can even go get your KonMari certification to help people channel their inner Marie Kondo and declutter their lives. We live in a weird world, but hey, that's a thing you can do. Anyway, with freelancing, the great thing about it is that the investment you have to make up front to provide that value usually is gonna come in the form of time and sweat. You're often not gonna have to spend a whole lot of money. For instance, as a web developer, I learned pretty much everything I know for free, just looking at blogs, online resources, and that was over 10 years ago. Today, the resources for web development education that are free are vastly better than they were when I was learning. Codecademy is a great example. Okay, three tips for getting started as a freelancer. Number one, and this is super important, you have to build an online portfolio. Have a place where people can look at the work you've done for clients in the past and judge whether or not your services are going to be right for them. If you don't have any clients right now, do some work on your own or possibly do some spec work for a nonprofit or something just to get some experience under your belt and a project that you can show off. Number two, put what you do and where you are in your social media bios. I'm talking Twitter, I'm talking Instagram, I'm talking LinkedIn. People like me often go to Twitter and type in things like freelance graphic designer, freelance motion graphics artist. And then I will just start clicking on profiles, looking at the pin tweets, looking at the URL in the profile. Hopefully it's a portfolio. And I've made hiring decisions based on that kind of a search process. So do it. And finally, number three, build relationships with other freelancers who offer complementary services. So if you're a freelance video editor like Tony, you might wanna build some relationships with freelance motion graphics artists. That way, if a client comes along who needs both services, if they find the other person, they might be able to refer you and vice versa. Our second method for making money on the internet is affiliate marketing. So getting into affiliate marketing means essentially becoming an unofficial salesperson for another company. You sign up for their affiliate program, you put links to their products on your website or in your YouTube video descriptions, and then when people click those links or use your discount code and buy that product, you get a commission of that sale. Affiliate marketing actually drives a significant portion of the revenue that comes into my business, particularly over on my website, College Info Geek. For example, Skillshare's affiliate program program pays $10 whenever anybody signs up through my link. So on my website, I have all these little ads up for my own courses over on Skillshare. Whenever anybody clicks those and signs up, I get $10. The internet's biggest affiliate program is Amazon's. Now the commission they pay on most product sales is pretty small, but the upside of participating in that program is that, well,
well, you can link to pretty much any product on Amazon and there's millions of products. So sites like The Wirecutter make pretty much all of their income by creating buyer's guides, guides on the best headphones or the best Bluetooth speaker. And when somebody comes in and clicks the buy button on their recommendation, they get a cut of that sale. So how much money can you make with affiliate marketing? Well, it varies really, really wildly. For one example, ConvertKit, which is an email marketing service, pays their affiliates a recurring 30% commission on any sale they bring in, recurring. So as somebody who uses ConvertKit, I have about 100,000 people on my email list, which means I have to reluctantly fork over about $700 a month to ConvertKit. And that means that the person who referred me, because there was somebody who referred me, is making a nice $210 a month just off of me, recurring. On the other end of the spectrum, we have programs like Amazon's, which again, don't pay a whole lot per sale. At present moment, for example, they are currently paying 3% for headphone sales. So if we wanna go back to our wire cutter example, if wire cutter is recommending a $200 pair of headphones, that means that if somebody clicks their link, they're making $6 on that sale. And that means that wire cutter has to bring a crap ton of traffic into their headphone buying guide. Let's be super generous and say that 1% of the people who read that guide actually go on to buy those headphones through their link. That means they're essentially making making six cents per page view. So to make that same $210 that the ConvertKit affiliate made just off of me, they need to bring in 3,500 page views. So to be successful as an affiliate marketer, you have to do three things. First, you have to find programs that pay a good amount per sale. Second, you need to figure out how to drive more traffic to the web pages that contain your links or the YouTube videos that contain them. And finally, you wanna find a way to increase your conversion percentage, which is the portion of people who actually click your links and then the portion of those people who actually go on to buy. How do you do those things? Well, for the first problem, you just need to do your research. And platforms like Impact actually contain a marketplace where companies can post their affiliate programs and their conversion percentages, and then you can apply to join those programs if you like. For traffic, you wanna build an audience. There's a couple of different strategies for doing this. Personally, I built a blog and then a podcast and then a YouTube channel around a general topic that I was interested in. And then over time, as affiliate opportunities arose for that topic, I added them in organically. But some people take the opposite strategy. Some people will first find a product they wanna promote, and then they will use keyword research to try to match that to a problem or an interest that people have. And if you wanna go this route, you can use tools like hrefs.com to do keyword research. You're looking for keywords that have a decent amount of search interest, but not a lot of competition. And if you find one, you can start writing articles on it or making YouTube videos on it in the hopes that you're gonna rank well in either Google searches or in YouTube search. And if you bring in traffic, you're hopefully gonna bring in affiliate commissions. Finally, you wanna find a way to increase those conversion percentages. And this could be an entire video all on its own. I don't know if it would fit on this general channel, but essentially you wanna start learning marketing strategies and get data driven. So track how much traffic you get and how many clicks you get, then make a change and then track the data again and compare and see what you can do. Income source number three, uh, European three, is the programmatic ad. So programmatic ads are ads that run alongside content that you create. These are different from brand deals, which we're gonna talk about next, because programmatic ads are not sold by you and you don't deliver the talking points yourself either. So the example that you're probably most familiar with is YouTube AdSense, which runs the ads that you see, and let's be honest, probably try to skip every single time before you watch a video, unless you're watching this on Nebula, which has no ads. Anyway, when it comes to programmatic ads, the acronym, actually no, it's not an acronym, it's an initialism, and the initialism that you wanna keep in mind is CPM, which stands for cost per meal, and meal is just the Latin, French, and Italian word for thousands. So we're talking about cost per thousand views here. This is how these ads are often priced. So if the CPM is on average $2, which it could be here on YouTube quite often, then that means if you wanna make the same $210 that we had back in our affiliate marketing example, you gotta bring in 105,000 views. So as you can see, if you wanna make money on programmatic ads, you gotta have a huge audience, which is why you probably see most of your favorite YouTubers diversifying their income streams, doing brand deals, doing merch. AdSense can be a decent revenue stream. I make about seven or $8,000 a month on it, but it is one of my smaller income streams and I don't rely on it. Again, because the CPMs are so small, you have to have a huge audience 
to rely on it. That being said, if you are hell bent on being the next Jacksepticeye or Mr. Beast, and you know you're gonna be bringing in millions of views, there is something really important I need to talk to you about when it comes to programmatic advertising, and that is the relationship between views and income. A lot of people think this relationship is very strong and they'll often ask me questions like, hey dude, how much money could I make off of a million views? To which I always have to answer, it really, really depends. Views and income are not strongly correlated. Views are only one variable in a very complex equation. And this is gonna be obvious to you if you think about it for more than a few seconds. So let's do an example here. Let's say that I run a company that sells expensive pool cleaning robots. If I'm considering running ads on my friend Matt's channel that's all about pool maintenance, I can be reasonably sure about a couple of different things. Number one, the people watching Matt's videos probably own pools. Otherwise, why would they be watching videos about how to clean a pool? And number two, because those people most likely own pools, I can also be reasonably sure that those people probably make a decent amount of money as well because they own pools. So that means I have a relatively affluent potential customer base. And because of that, I might be willing to pay a $10 CPM to advertise on one of Matt's videos, which means that even if he's only bringing in 10,000 views on a video, those views are gonna be worth a lot. And to give you a counter example, let's talk about Philip DeFranco. I love Philip DeFranco's channel, but let's be honest, a lot of what Philly D talks about is essentially celebrity gossip and controversy. And something that we know about celebrity gossip and controversy as humans who love us a little bit of schadenfreude in the morning is that all kinds of people are gonna click on that, which means that if I'm running that pool robot company, I can't really be reasonably sure about who is in Philly D's audience. It could be a pool owner, it could be somebody living in an apartment who has no interest in owning a pool whatsoever. And because of that, I can't afford to spend as much per view on Philip's channel. Maybe I'm gonna pay a 50 cent CPM. So to make the same amount of money that Matt makes on 10,000 views, Philly D is going to have to bring in well, what's 20 times 10,000? It's gonna be 200,000 views. So again, the correlation between views and income is extremely weak. And if you wanna be successful with programmatic advertising, you either need to bring in millions and millions of views on you know, video games or celebrity gossip or whatever you want, or maybe a little more strategic here, you pick a topic that's a little more niched down and that has a viewer base who might be a little more primed to buy slightly more expensive products. Now, I was picking on Billy D a little bit earlier, but he has something that is actually a huge feather in his cap, which is a loyal audience. Audience. And that makes his channel a great fit for, wait for it, brand deals. So brand deals, these are the sponsored segments that you're gonna see on most high view YouTube videos these days. These are the sponsored segments that are read by the creators themselves. And if you're watching this video on YouTube, you're gonna see one at the end of this video. And if you're somebody who usually skips those ads, I would say maybe stick around and watch this one just to see how I structure it. Because with brand deals and sponsor segments, there is a huge amount amount of price variability. And that is because there are a ton of different factors that go in to the quality and the effectiveness of an ad. With a programmatic ad, you don't have a whole lot you can control. You can control the topic of your video, which may control the segment of people who watch it and influence your CPM somewhat. You can control the quality of the video to try to bring in more views, but that's about it. I guess you can also control ad placement, so pre-roll, post-roll, but with a sponsored segment, you have so much more control because you as the creator are doing the read yourself. The good news is that sponsored segments and brand deals typically pay a lot more than programmatic ads, sometimes 10 times more, sometimes even 20 times more. And that's because ads that are voiced by the creator, by the person that the viewer came to watch, are simply a lot more effective. The main downside is that brand deals are typically a little bit less accessible when you're getting started. And that's because you're gonna need to build up a sizable audience on your platform of choice first. Once you're bringing in a significant amount of views on YouTube or on Instagram or wherever it is, that's when you're gonna start seeing Raid Shadow Legends and various pubic hair removal products sliding into your DMs. Now, there are a lot of factors that are gonna go into the effectiveness of your spots, but the most important one, especially for your long-term success, is trust. You have to put your audience first, which means only promoting products that you know are going to be valuable and helpful for the people who watch and trust you. Another important concept that can increase the effectiveness of your sponsor reads is the ADA framework, which stands for attention, 
interest, desire, and action. I think I first learned about this concept in the movie Glen Gary, Glen Ross, where Alec Baldwin explains it with a lot more swear words than you're gonna hear in this video, but essentially a good ad follows these steps in this order. First, working to get the viewer's attention, then getting them interested by talking about something that the viewer hopefully cares about. Only at that point is it useful to start introducing the product's talking points and tying them to that interest. I see a lot of ads here on YouTube that do that whole smooth segue thing but then immediately launch into the talking points for the product, which makes the ads less effective than they could be. Lastly, I have to say this. If you're a creator who gets approached about brand deals, remember what I talked about earlier with regards to views and pricing. They are not strongly linked. So it may be worth pricing your first couple of deals with a brand or an agency based on price, since you really don't have a whole lot of extra data to give them at that point. But after that, you shouldn't be pricing solely based on views and never let an agency talk you into a view guarantee because you know the views are not strongly linked to pricing. So if they are trying to make you believe that they are, they're probably not treating you fairly. Finally, we have method number five, which is selling your own products, like this cool Pixelama sticker that I have on this mug, which is not mine, but the sticker is. So if you wanna sell your own products, I don't blame you because whether we're talking about sponsor segments or CPA ads or affiliate commissions, in any case, you're advertising somebody else's product, which means that you don't get the entirety of that sale. You just get a small slice of the pie. And what if you want the entire pie for yourself? Well, selling your own products can get you that, minus your expenses, of course. So the main thing I wanna talk about when it comes to sales of your own products is that doing this almost always involves some kind of upfront investment. That could be monetary investment in the case that you have to buy inventory, though there are ways to mitigate that using crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter is one of them, but there is almost always going to be a huge upfront investment of your effort and time. And since this is your own product that you haven't sold before, there is a big risk factor because you don't know how well it's going to sell. So my main tip here is to do some market research. And the one example that always comes to mind when I think about this is involving my friend Grant Baldwin, who was a professional speaker who spoke at colleges and schools for most of his career. And at some point he wanted to create a course for people like yours truly who wanted to do the same thing. So instead of investing a ton of effort up front and creating this big long course and then trying to sell it, he first pre-sold access to a rough outline of the course to a small portion of his email list of which I was one of those people. And I bought access to that pre-sale, which was about half of the price of the regular course. And what I got at first was literally just an Evernote outline with a bunch of bullet points of the things he thought needed to be in the course. And personally, I found this really, really helpful because I'm a quick learner and I really liked just being able to go down this bullet list and get a lot of my initial questions answered. So this was, in my opinion, a really great way to do some market research, gauge that interest, and kind of mitigate the risk involved in selling your own products. Now, personally, I use all five of these methods to create multiple sources of income for my business. And if you're just starting out, that should be your eventual goal. But at the beginning, it'd be a good idea to just pick one of these and make that your focus at first. But no matter which one you choose, there is one common factor, which is that you need to create an online presence for yourself. If you're a freelancer, that's gonna include your portfolio where you can show potential clients your work. And if you're selling your own products, you need a place where people can go to buy them. But even if you just want to make money on YouTube, it's still a smart idea to create your own online space. You don't want your entire business to be at the mercy of a platform that you don't control. For me, that space is my personal website, thomasjfrank.com, where I have links to my book, to my courses that people can buy, and to other work that I've done. And if you want to create a space that's like mine, then the first thing you're going to need is a domain name, which you should get over at Hover. Hover is the best place on the internet to get your hands on domain names, not least of which because they have a pain-free, quick checkout process without any annoying pop-ups or friction. They also have hundreds of domain extensions you can choose from, so you can get your classic .com or .me, or you can get something kind of funky and interesting like I've gotten with thomas.lol. And one thing that I'm gonna note here is that even if you're not ready to start your business, if you do have a name in mind, it's a very smart idea to secure the domain name now so nobody else can take it from you once you are ready to get started. Once you do have your domain name, you can also create a professional looking email address for it, like thomas at collegeinfogeek.com 
thomasjfrank.com or thomas at thomasjfrank.com. Plus there's a feature called connect where you can easily connect your domain up to online website builders and even online store builders. So if you are ready to get your domain name, head over to hover.com slash thomasfrank where you can get 10% off your first order and support this channel. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, hitting that like button gently with your middle knuckle is definitely helpful. That helps the YouTube algorithm know that people like these videos and maybe it'll send it out to more people. So definitely helpful for me. And I just checked my stats the other day and realized that only 40% of the people who watch my videos are actually subscribed. So if you aren't subscribed yet and you enjoyed this video, definitely hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future videos. Beyond that, I'll have a couple other videos on the screen here that you can click on, or you can follow me over on Instagram where I'm doing Q and A videos every single week. If you've got questions, send them over and uh, that's it. So thanks for watching. And uh, if you don't wanna do anything I just said, well don't because I'm not your dad.